morning. Good morning. Good morning. The scripture for the text this morning is from Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. Under the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles, and are not, and hast found them liars, and hast borne, and hast patience, and for my name's sake hast labored, and hast not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art falling, and repent, and do thy first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. And this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Well, if you would there, if you haven't already, find your place in that last book of the Bible, Revelation. And I know we had, um, or there was uh, Valentine's Day this week, so I know you expected to come in, hear a wonderful story, a wonderful sermon about mushy love, and I just told you to open to Revelation chapter 2. But we are going to talk about some love here in just a moment. Uh, if you would, let's go to the Lord in prayer. And uh, before we pray again, if you're visiting with us, thank you for being here. Your honored guests, thank you for coming. Glad you're with us today. Let's pray. Father, we come to you this morning and we can say, Great are you, Lord. Lord, it literally in our lungs, it's your breath that we're breathing. And we thank you for life. And Lord, we pray that all that we do today and have done will bring honor and glory to Jesus Christ. And Lord, we just thank you for being, thank you for being God. Thank you, God, that I can cry out to you for help or, or in my frustration or in my bewilderment, God, I can, I can cry out to you because you can take it. Yeah. And Lord, in these few moments that we have here together before we dismiss and go about our week, I pray that you would just help us. Lord, I don't know how people might have found themselves in this room today. Lord, I pray you would meet us exactly where yeah. we're at. Uh, Lord, I pray you would, as you say, Keep the wicked one away from us, God, that we might just hear your word. Lord, I pray in that that you would uh, make me usable. Empty me of sin and self. Fill me with your spirit. And God, as again, thank you for those that are here. Thank you for their love, their encouragement, their friendship. Lord, just even by being here today. And Lord, again, thank you for all you do in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. So, I know some of you are like, Phil, when we get to Philippians, we're getting there soon. Okay, we're going to get to the next series. And every time I start to run to Philippians and start the series, God keeps bringing some things to my mind and my heart. Like especially last week, if you were here, we're in the Old Testament book of Jeremiah where we looked at uh, how he went down to the potter's house and the potter's wheel, how he is the potter, we are the clay. And, and sometimes we just need good reminders of that. And honestly, just thinking about Justin made it up, kind of alluded to it there. Over the last few months, especially the last few weeks, we've seen people come and partner with us at our church and, and be part of our church. And you that are here, you're visiting, you're part of our church as well. And, you know, as we worship and glorify God and seek to please Him and praise Him. And when we think about our church and think about the different things, you know, this church wasn't started a few years ago. This church was started, I was thinking, about 55 years ago. And so it's a, it's a place that's been here. It's been up through good times, through bad times, spiritual highs, and even spiritual lows. And and I will tell you right now, I'll be one of the spiritual highs to see the people that are coming and wanting to partner and want to serve and worship God and with us and those that are here and, and those that you're still praying about that. Hey, you be patient. You wait on the Lord and you pray about it. You want to be where God wants you to be. But anytime you are part of a church, there's always the possibility of things going off track. And, and really, that's the title of the sermon today is the point of it all. What is the point of it all? What is the thing that is the reason why we gather here together. There's lots of things that we can say. There's lots of good answers, right? We're here to worship God. We're here to glorify God. We're here to 
build relationships, to encourage each other. But ultimately, what is the point of it all? What is the main thing that God desires from what he calls the church, his bride, those who are believers in Christ, his brothers and sisters in Christ? And, and, and what I want us to do this morning for a little bit of time is I want us to look at a church. And we're going to look at the church at Ephesus. And so when you think of the church of Ephesus, a lot of times you think, well, Phil, there's a book of Ephesians, man. That's what we got. Can I tell you, the book of Ephesians is just part of it. It's just part of the life of that church. And in fact, we'll see in a little bit, the church at Ephesus actually starts out the book of Acts chapter 19 with the apostle Paul. And we'll maybe look at some verses there in a little bit. And then you got kind of some other parts that go to it. But you see in scripture, you see the birth of this church. You see its struggle and you see everything it goes through, and ultimately, in my opinion, you actually see the death of it. And when you get to Revelation 2, I believe you really see where the church of Ephesus ceases. It ultimately just falls apart. And there's lots of things that you can see in this church that you can learn from, and lots of lessons and process take place. And I don't know if you know this, but there's more talked about and written to this church at Ephesus than any other church in Scripture. More than any of the rest of them in that and, and we see that like I said it born in chapter number 19 and we watched in the book of Ephesians how Paul encourages them and challenges them and then in the books of first and second Timothy even though it's written to Timothy in some of the last letters excuse me that Paul writes it's actually challenging the church at Ephesus uh, with that because guess what Timothy actually was a pastor there for a while so I mean a lot of interesting things and and then we watch uh, the church at Ephesus get rebuked even or challenged again even in the books of 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. So that tells you something else. Not only did they have the Apostle Paul who started the church, they had Timothy who was there for a while as a pastor in church, and then they had John. John's the disciple, the one whom Jesus loved. And, and so we, and then we see here in the book of Revelation where Christ himself basically threatens this church. So what's the point of it all? What's the point of it all? And, and I want us to see this as, as we study this and and really, I kind of joked about this. If you ever had an all-star staff, like you ever looked at a staff at a work or a job and like, man, they are a ball team and say, man, they have got it together. They've got, I mean, everywhere you look, it's a home run, whether who's organizing or who's working things out. I mean, you think about the staff that this church had. I mean, it's really hard to say you guys didn't know what was going on. You didn't weren't informed. I mean, you think about it. When you look at this, say, well, who started your church? Well, Paul did. Okay. Uh, well, who, who's currently your pastor? Timothy, uh, the, the disciple of, of Paul. Well, well, where did he Paul we train? He trained under Paul. And, well, where did Paul train? Well, he trained under Christ. I mean, you start looking at this and you start saying, there's a pretty good resume here. And the reason I'm saying this is because when you look at the church of Ephesus, I think if you're like me on the outside, you're like, man, when my kids grow older and they go off to church, this is a church I want them to be a part of. And not only that, as we see here, another one of the guys who is probably, if you want to call it, the lead pastor, executive pastor, is John, the disciple whom Jesus loved. That was his nickname. So when you see this here, there's a lot that you can say they have opportunity to grow in the grace and knowledge of Christ. I mean, they had three guys in particular that pastored this church where two of them wrote large chunks of the scripture. And another one in Timothy who was very maturing in the faith and those things. So you see a lot of things happening here that are very, very interesting. Now, before we dive into the passage in Revelation 2, I have to kind of explain to you just a little bit where we're at. You know me, I like context. Revelation is one of those books that when I said Revelation, some of you might have went, ooh, we're going to Revelation. That's a little spooky feel. You know, like, and there's some of you like, man, let's jump in, man. Let's just have some fun. Let's jump in. Let's do that. Can I tell you, Revelation is one of those books as a believer in Christ you should not fear. Amen. None of the word of God you should fear. It's all <laughs> written for our, for our knowledge, for our worship, for our growth. In fact, we won't take time to read it, but over in chapter 1, it's actually given this. It says, there's a blessing given to those who read it and listen to it be read. The only book of the Bible, by the way, that there's a blessing given to those that read it and listen to it. And if you think about what's one of the books that we run away from. You said Leviticus. Okay. But that's in your Bible reading schedule. Okay. Well, what's one of the books that you run away from? Revelation, right? They say, well, I can't understand it all. Well, first off, welcome to the club. Okay. There's a lot of things we don't understand. A lot of things you debate. There's a lot of great things all throughout the book of Revelation that we miss because we, we don't know exactly what that means and what's coming. 
It was the only book with a promise. And again, it's written by John, the disciple whom Jesus loved, which, by the way, just for free, in case you like uh, scoring at home, of the 12 disciples, ultimately 13, count Matthias, who replaced Judas, John is the only disciple who is not martyred and killed. He's the only one. All the rest of them were killed. In fact, they, many believe James was probably the first one that was uh, martyred and was killed, his brother, James and John, the sons of thunder. But John dies of old age. But you say, well, man, how did he get such a life of luxury? Well, he was exiled to an island. He was boiled in oil. He was pretty much beaten within an inch of his life. He just didn't die. So if you want to say he got the good end of the stick, however you want to look at it, okay? But John writes this, the man who saw Jesus not just in life, but buried and resurrected. And the Bible says that when he saw Jesus in this book of Revelation, when Jesus revealed himself to him in the book of Revelation, to what we're to read here, it says that when he saw him, the man that saw the resurrected Christ before, but when he saw this Jesus in his glory, he says, I fall on my face as if I was dead. That's verse 17. I just fell on my face. And he says, ultimately, Jesus says, I am he that which was alive, or excuse me, I was he that was dead and now is alive. And behold, I'm alive forevermore and have the keys to hell and to death. And so he says, I'm going to tell you some things you need to write here. And so he starts writing off and he says, there's these churches, these seven churches in chapters two and three that I want you to write some things to. A lot of those churches, I'm going to start off with some good things and I'm going to bring the hammer. You know how that is? You go to work, someone says, man, that's what I'll tell you. You're doing such a wonderful job. I love you. I want to compliment you. But by the way, kapow. And they bring it into the side like that. You get some of that in the book in those, in those seven churches that he talks to and what he talks about. But he starts off in chapter two talking about the church at Ephesus. Now to understand the church at Ephesus, we're looking again, in my opinion, at a church that's been going on now for 60 to 70 years. Not too far off from where we're at. A church that experienced God's blessing. A church that experienced God doing some supernatural things, some great things that you only look back, and by the way, this is the best way to, that you just look back and say, that's God, God only, there's no other way to explain it. That's right. And that's always a wonderful thing. And so you see all these things, but before we dive into kind of the warning here of this, and as we said, the point of it all, I'm going to look back, at, and if you want to follow me there, to Acts chapter number 19. I want you to see the beginning of this church. So in Acts 19, and again, I'm not going to dive through all of this in Acts chapter number 19, but it just kind of gives you an idea of kind of how this church started. Which, by the way, if you ever like church history, different things, the book of Acts is great. I was looking back at it. We went through the book of Acts uh, as a sermon series back as actually uh, almost five years ago. And to me, it sounds great. Some of y'all have been here for actually like I've been here for five years, yes. And it's been nice all five years. But, you know, there's a lot of good things in the book of Acts. But when you read the book of Acts, you see when Christ leaves and how the apostle Paul comes on the scene and how he does these great works. And what he'll do, he'll go to a place start a church, and then leave. But how he starts that church is always very interesting. He doesn't go buy a building, put a sign out front, service times, meet here, you know, on the fifth Sunday, sing in Greek, whatever. You, he didn't do that. He would normally go into the marketplaces. He would go into a lot of times the, the pagan temples of the day, and he would just start proclaiming Christ, okay? And so he'd start doing that. And so we see Paul here in Acts chapter 19, verse number 11, it says this, and God wrought special miracles by the hand of Paul. Excuse me. So that from his body were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs or aprons, and diseases departed from them, and the evil spirits went out of them. That sounds pretty interesting, doesn't it? Paul just goes around. God gives him powers, power of God. People start getting healed, different things like that. Then look in verse 13. Then certain of the vagabond Jews, exorcists. Now, if you're like me, immediately I peek up when I see that. It says, took upon them to call over them. Uh, which had evil spirits uh, by the name of the Lord Jesus saying, we adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preaches. And there were seven sons of one Sceva, a Jew and a chief of the priests, which did so. And so let me just catch you up here. So Paul comes through in the city of Ephesus at this time, just, just to let you know, and I'm not going to dive into details. I know we have a mixed audience with younger people here, but Ephesus is not this, uh, 
It's not the good old Bible Belt, if I can say it like that. There's not a church on every corner. There's not a Bible-believing, teaching, Jesus is God church anywhere. They, they are very Romanized with many, many uh, different gods and goddesses that they, they worshipped. Uh, to give you an idea, um, there was the temple to, the, uh, to, uh, to Artemis. Artemis was uh, the god of love and sensuality, if I can say it like that. To give you the idea, when you come into that, there were a thousand men and women that would give themselves as priests and priestesses. All their job was was prostitution. And that was the religion they worshipped. It was all about pleasure. It was all about those different things. So here you got Paul coming in. Paul comes in and God blesses him with the power to heal people. And, and so to the point where people are like, hey man, if you just touch this apron, if you just touch the garment, if you just, by the way, it should kind of make you think of another story. In the life of Christ, the woman with the issue of blood, she touched the hem of his garment was healed. And so these people start getting healed by Paul. And they're like, how is he doing this? And he's basically saying, at the name of Jesus, be healed. At the name of, now I'm not telling you, you're going to go out here today and you go to the mall, you know, down here. And you see somebody there with a cane and say, hey, listen to Pastor Phil today. Paul was a guy. I'm a guy. <clears throat> at the name of Jesus. And he kicked their, kicked their cane out from underneath them. Don't do that. Okay? <laughs> All right? You're going to need to rise up and walk very quickly if you do that. Probably just telling you that, all right? But God came upon him and gave him that. And some of you, I just ruined the whole sermon for you. But anyhow, it's okay. Some of you are like, I just want to kick the cane part, but it's okay. Anyhow, he comes through and he says, At the name of Jesus, be healed, be forgiven. And people are starting to be healed of diseases. People are starting to have a lot of things that were going on. And, and by the way, I don't know if you noticed that there's a group of them there. They're called the Sons of Sceva. That does not sound like a legit group that you want to hang out with, right? The Seven Sons of Sceva. A lot of S's there. It doesn't sound real great. And so, but these guys, I don't know if you noticed, were Jews. So they're living in a Gentile land, so they kind of know the Old Testament. They know all of that. They've heard of Jesus a little bit. They're the itinerant Jews. And what they had done, they had made their living off being exorcists. So if people said they were demon-possessed or had some, they go up and they do their little thing and you pay them money and that's how uh, you got relieved of whatever was wrong with you or of your kid or something like that. Some of you are like, where's the sons of Skiba? i got a kid problem. But no, that's not what we're talking about right now, okay? And so they would do all these. But the problem is, here comes Paul preaching the gospel in the name of Jesus. People are being healed. These sons of Skiba are like, man, this is cutting into my money. It's cutting into what I'm trying to do. And so they start going up, these seven sons of Sceva, and they start going up to people and they start saying, at the name of the Lord Jesus, whom Paul preaches, and they go up to this one dude and say, demon, come out. And I love the next verse. Maybe it's a little too personal or a little too selfish. I love a good fight. I don't know if you like a good fight. So they're going, <coughs> excuse me, going up, and they're saying in verse 14, these sons of Sceva go up and say, hey, at the name of Jesus, we want you to pay us, and we're going to cast you out, and look to a guy that's demon-possessed, okay? All right? And look at verse 15. So they go up and say, in the name of Jesus, come out. And the spirit, the evil spirit, answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, and who are ye? And the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them and overcame them and prevailed against them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. You know, I'm sitting there thinking to myself, when you ever watch a fight, whether it's a schoolyard fight or they watch a fight on TV, there's always the great debate on who won the fight. You probably remember growing up if you were in a fight. Man, I won that fight. No, no, I won that fight. But can I tell you, there's really no debate. If you go into a fight with clothes <laughs> and you leave without, you didn't win that fight. Okay, you didn't win the fight. And remember, one dude, seven sons of Sceva. I, again, if God in heaven, I mean, it, I just want to know what this dude was like. But again, it's not him, it's the evil spirit, right? But I love what it says here. At the name of Jesus, he goes, the evil spirit, this is a demon. Okay? Not trying to belittle that, not trying to get spooky with it. Trying to, the demon goes, we know Jesus. We know Jesus. And we've heard Paul, which to me is fascinating. 
that Paul, remember, demons not all over the world. God's the only being that's omnipresent at all places at all times. Not the demons, not the devil. We know Jesus. We've even heard of Paul. Paul's coming to town. Hey guys, Paul, here he comes. We don't know you. Because we can't touch Jesus. We obey him. And we can't lay a finger on Paul. But we don't know who you are. And what the point is of what you're doing. And it says the evil spirit leaped out of the man. And basically just had a good old shakedown. And just beat the mess up. And that says, I mean, I have to read it again. It says, and they left the house. They fled the house naked and wounded. Okay? It did not work out the way they thought. It was supposed to work out. And so it goes on to say in verse number 17, And this was known to all the Jews and Greeks also dwelling at Ephesus. And fear <laughs> fell on them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. I bet it was. <laughs> I bet it was. Can you imagine the water cooler later that day? Hey, dude, you hear about this? Keep them boys. <laughs> They've all done tried to do the same thing. Paul, this guy, new guy, Paul. Doing, and man, this demon. I mean, they, they're the exorcists. They're the town exorcists, right? If you had this need for that, that this web, <coughs> dude, this thing came leaping out of this dude. He didn't beat one of them. He beat all seven of them, and dude, he beat the clothes off of them, and they took off. Yeah, I think fear would fall upon them, but it doesn't just say fear. It says, and what else? It says, and the name of the Lord Jesus was what magnified. It's, we got to find out more about this Jesus. This Jesus must be true. This Jesus must be the God. And it says in verse 18, And many that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds. That's a wonderful thing. They're coming to Christ. And they even go further. Look what it says. Many of them, which also used curious arts, brought their books together and burned them before all men. And they counted the price of them and found that 50,000 pieces of silver so mightily grew the word of God and prevail. And that, my brothers and sisters, is how the church at Ephesus began. A little unique, wouldn't you say? You're going to love Philippians, how that starts when we get to that in a few weeks. But this is kind of an interesting way how the gospel <laughs> began and the church at Ephesus was born. I mean, at the name of Jesus, people are being healed. Uh, guys doing not in the name of Jesus and not truly with Christ. They're getting beat up by, you know, these evil spirits, these different things. I mean, they're so into it that they're saying this. Even though our town is known for for uh, for demon possession and witchcraft and immorality, all it said that you notice the part that said they took books. Took all their books that were uh, false gods and witchcraft and all of a sudden they put them in the yard and burned them. They're like, we want no part of that. It's all about you. So this seems like somebody that's like a group of people that, hey, we're devoted, man. We're in. Like this we're going to leave who we were. Thank God we're going to go forward with what Paul is saying about this man, Jesus. So this sounds pretty legit. I don't know if you've ever been a part of a church that started like that. I have not. Okay? But it sounds pretty interesting. So it sounds like, you ever hear someone say this phrase? Man, when they got, and I know what we mean by that. Man, when they got saved, they got saved. You know what I mean? Like, it wasn't like a slow change. Like, it was going one way. And they totally the other way. I mean, when, and, and understand, when we're saved, we're saved. But it's kind of like those people. When they got saved, they got it, right? So, so here you got this, this group of people. And, and back there in Revelation chapter number 2 is where we're going to get to. And so that's how they started. That's how they started. And so you see from that point, they got Paul for about two years. And, and then after that, they've got... They've got uh, the, the disciple John that comes in and preaches and teaches and gives all the eyewitnesses account like what we read in the Gospels. He gives it to them and just preaches that and teaches that to them, loves all and pastors them for years. And then finally when John's gone, what happens? Uh, Timothy comes in towards the end of Paul's life. And, and so now he's ministering and doing those things. So again, an all-star staff that you can see here. And, and, but what begins to happen? When you come to the book of Revelation, they have begun to do what the great fear is anytime that God does a great work in a church and a body of believers. Be careful of drifting away. Be careful of drifting away. And, and really, 
It was in a painful way. And, and they didn't drift in a way that you would expect. Okay? Or not in a way I would at least expect. And so let's look at the end of this church. Let's look at where they fell away and what happened. Because I think in it we will truly see what the point of it all is. And get some insight here. So there's some things I want to say here as we go to read verse 1. There's some things that this church did really well. Okay? This group of people did really well. There's about three things we'll see here in a second. But here's what I want to start you off with. Look down in verse number 1 of Revelation 2. Unto the angel or unto the messenger of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. That's Jesus. Talking about Jesus, okay? He says, this is what Jesus said. I know thy works, verse 2, and thy labor of love, and thy patience or endurance, and how thou cannot bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them, which say they are apostles, and are not, and has found them liars, and has borne, and has patience or endured, and for my name's sake has labored, and has not fainted. So what you see in this passage here, I mean, it starts really great in verses 2 and 3. There's some things about this church that I want to highlight that honestly, again, I said it earlier. These are things that if I looked on a website, I would really love for my kids to go to church, this church. Okay? And let's look at it. There's three things in particular they do well. One is this. They're serious about holiness. This church was serious about holiness. Also, they were doctrinally sound. Doctrinally sound. And then thirdly, what we'll see in just a second is this. They were able to endure. They endured a lot of what they faced. So some things that they did well, it says, one is they were serious about holiness. Look back in verse 2. I, this is Jesus speaking, I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience and how I cannot bear them which are what? Evil. So the church at Ephesus, 65 to 70 years old, if that's about the time frame, they were serious about holiness. They would work, they would toil, they had patient endurance, but they were serious about holiness. They wanted to live holy lives before God, to be holy as I am holy, saith the Lord. They were serious about that. They, they were, excuse me, in a place that a lot of immorality, a lot of different things were going on. And they said, in the place that we live, we're, not, we're going to be in the world, but we're not going to be of the world. We're going to be serious about holiness. We're not going to act the way people act who are apart from Christ. Not because we're better than them, but because we have Jesus Christ living inside us. They were serious about holiness. They were serious about that. We, we don't want to do things that are, that are against God. We're, we're serious about sin. We're serious about holiness in that. But it also says this, they were doctrinally sound. So not only did it say they hated evil works, look what it says back in verse 2. He says that in the middle of verse 2, and thou hast tried or tested them, which say they are apostles, and are not, and hast found them liars. So can I tell you something? The only way that you can spot a false, a false apostle the only way that you can fall, uh, identify false teaching is to know right teaching. Now I'm going to say that again because it's important. The only way you can identify what is false, unbiblical teaching is to know what true biblical teaching is. That's why while I'm here, and I'm going to encourage myself with this, encourage you with this, is that the only time you get into this book is Sunday mornings at 1030, you're doing yourself a great disservice. Amen. The Bible says study to show thyself approved unto God. The Bible talks about this book of the law, Joshua 1.8. If you like the word success, it only appears one time in Scripture. One time. And it appears in Joshua 1.8. You know what it talks about? This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth. But thou shalt meditate in it day and night. You may observe to do according to all that's written therein. Amen. But then thou shalt find thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt find good success. And so it talks about it's the word of God. No one, you say, Phil, I read the Bible, man, and I just don't get it. It's okay. Keep reading it. You know what I do? I pray when it, before I read. You say, you've been reading the Bible for years. Don't matter. You ever read something one time and get one thing out of the Bible, read something again a second time? like, okay, God, thank you. You're like, every time I open it, it's a different thing. That's why, because the Bible is living. It's the living word, and it speaks in multiple ways and applies in many ways. One, in, one interpretation, but many applications to the word of God where you can apply where you're at in your life. The Bible says in Psalm 119, Hide, that I might hide thy word in my heart, that I, I might not sit against God. That thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I'm always going to encourage you, push you to always dive into this. Because if not, something is going to be the basis for what you do, say, and think. You ever heard someone say one time, 
I know the Bible doesn't really say that, but I think that should be a red flag. Well, I know it says this, but that's a red flag. Because what are you doing? It's false teaching. It's false. And by the way, the quickest way to get false teaching is to teach yourself what you think is right and what your emotions say and what your feelings are and, and what you think is right and wrong in those things. But it's what does the Bible say in those things? What does the Bible say? What is the Bible teaching? And that's how you spot it, to know true teaching in those things. And, and, and just to always say this, you know, and, and, and it's always want to be true. And, and for however long God has me here, I want this to be my goal, is to faithfully proclaim the Word of God. I love good music. I love programs. I love community. I love all those things. But if we don't faithfully proclaim the Word of God in everything we do, we have missed the point. Amen. We have to know the Word. It's kind of like this. You can't claim promises of God that you don't know. Well, I'm just going to claim the promises of God. What, what promise are you talking about? What do you know? What are you thinking? And, and when you see this, what has happened up to this point, and what he's saying is this. He's saying someone has shown up to this church at Ephesus and saying basically, I'm an apostle. I'm, some, I'm an apostle. I know God. I know of God. I'm from God. And they start to teach, and they're like, boss, you ain't an apostle. So these people are sound doctrine. They're like, okay, keep preaching. Okay, stop. That's not what this says. That's not what Jesus said. That's not what John taught us. That's not what Paul taught us. It's not those things. And so they're able to say that because they're saying, in fact, here's the point. They didn't just say, well, that's not right. They said, actually, this is what's right. See, they were sound in doctrine. And here is the danger, if I may go here for a second. People get swept up in different movements, different beliefs, denominations, whatever you want to do. But if you're not careful, it's all about the experience, how you feel. Instead of what does God say for me and for my life today? It's got to be what thus saith the Lord. It has to be that. And by the way, people that get swept up in false teaching are good people. People whom we love. But it's easy for me to get swept up in the false teaching. And i got to stop saying, man, that sounds really good. But is that true? I mean, so there's some people today in some false teaching, and I won't say names of anything, that are, that are excellent speakers, excellent orators. Like, I look and go, man, I wish I could speak like you. I don't have that ability. I mean, they, they, can, sell, they can sell, you know, popsicles and ice to, you know, Eskimos. I mean, I mean, they, they can sell it to anybody. Right? And sometimes I'm like, Lord, if I could just say my words without saying something stupid, that would be great, you know, kind of thing. Actually pronounce words right, that would be great. You know, I have all that thing that I think about. But when it comes down to it, it's saying it's not the flattery of words. What it is, is that these guys were sound men and women of doctrine. That when someone came in, who obviously did, and says, you know what, I'm a God, and it says this. And they're like, nope, <coughs> not what God said. In fact, this is what God said. In fact, some of the highest praise ever given by the Apostle Paul is to the church at Berea, the Bereans. He said they test everything that's said by whoever speaks it, even me, Paul. And they test it to see if it's of God or not. So I'm always going to encourage you, don't just swallow everything that you hear. Even if it's somebody you know and love, okay? Don't just swallow everything that you hear. Take it to the Word of God. Test it and see what it says, okay? All right? Now, now don't get, don't get petty. Okay. Phil, you call that the book of Habakkuk. And technically it's called the book of Habakkuk. You know, don't, don't get into that, okay? Don't, don't be that way. Don't, don't be petty. But you know what I mean? The things that matter, the things of doctrine that are, that are right. But we see there are people of doctrine, they're doctrinally sound, they're serious about holiness, but also they endure. Look in verse 3. He says, And has born or, or endured and has patience, and for my sake has labored and has not fainted. So uh, let's think about endurance, okay? So you know this, but let's, I just kind of want to highlight it for a second. What I mean is this. Do you know that none of the compulsions that you and I have and struggle with today are new to humanity? None of the things that pull us away from the things of God, those that pull us away from holiness, that pull us in a way that is not pleasing to God, none of the desires and temptations that you and I have, none of that's new. It may come and shaped in a different way. None of it's new. And I want you to just kind of stop and think about it for a second. None of the compulsions that you and I have in this modern day age are new. 
I mean, we look around and say things are immoral, the culture's bad. But remember what I just told you about the city of Ephesus. These people lived in a, in a city where there was a temple to Artemis with, with all of that going around, around the clock, around them. And just constantly going on. So it's not like, oh, look what happened to humanity. Humanity has been, can I tell you, humanity's been a train wreck since uh, Genesis chapter 3. Humanity's been a train wreck since Genesis chapter 3. And you got to read Genesis chapter 3 sometime uh, this week. And you'll honestly start feeling better about 2024. Okay? I mean, seriously, I'm trying to help us. And it's like, we're like, all oh, today, all is lost. This is the worst it's ever been. But here's what I'm telling you. You've got a group of men and women in a church who still had the same compulsion, still had the way that they were raised, still had all those things, whether they dealt with lust or whether they dealt with anger or, or compulsion towards whatever you name it. It existed. And on top of that compulsion, at many times, it hits many of us, even this temptation, is what I believe really true. Should I walk away from my faith? And that's on this group of people that's being... Now, by the way tormented and persecuted okay i'm just trying to paint the picture for you here at this church before we just we're good at this passion but let's let's see what it says no one in this room had to deal with those people had to deal with you say what do you mean no one in this room is going to have to have is going to have their house looted today because they love jesus probably nobody in this room is going to get beaten as you walk home from church <clears throat> And nobody that's in a police force say, oh, it's okay, we'll let it go. Because they're Jesus lovers. No one's going to have anything stolen. No one in here is probably going to be in prison for coming to church today. But that's what these people face. And Jesus said, I know how you faithfully endure. I know how you've been persecuted. I know how you've gone through things. No, no one's going to have their stuff taken away from them. And by the way, no offense, this is not the world we're living in. And by the way, thank God. I thank God that we don't have certain kind of persecution. We have the freedoms that we have. But on top of their own compulsions, on top of their own desire to follow the Lord, they also have the full force of this group of people, as I'm saying, that basically had this mentality, anti-Christianity, that had this mentality, let's wipe them off the face of the earth with their government helping them. And Jesus says, you have been faithful, you have endured, you haven't turned back, you keep moving forward, I'm proud of you. That's what's being said. And again, if I'm on the Ephesus website up to this point, I'm sitting there going, hey, they're serious about holiness. They're doctrinally sound. There's people that endure. No matter what comes their way, they seem to stay on it. I'm kind of thinking to myself, where do I join this church at? You know what I mean? They seem to have a lot together. Okay? Yet I think the critique that Jesus gives here, beginning in verse 4, is devastating. And it undoes all of what he just complimented them for. And that's what I want us to get to today. I think what Jesus critiques these people for, beginning in verse 4, just totally nullifies all these things. Look in verse number 4 and 5. <clears throat> Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Now I'll stop there for a second. So, the critique, the thing that is ultimately the point of it all is this. They have abandoned their first love. They've abandoned it. In fact, Jesus goes on to say in verse 5, Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen, or the high places you were, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and I will remove thy candlestick out of this place, except thou repent. Now by the way, say, what does candlestick mean? He means my presence. May God help us be a place that every time we gather, the presence of the Lord is here. Yeah, yeah. May we not do this in vain. May God constantly and always be in our midst. That's right. In that. You say, Phil, the Holy Spirit dwells inside of me. Absolutely. I can quench him just as good as the next person. We can stifle it just as good as the next person. And so he's telling here, and I don't know if you understand this, this is a threat. He's like, I don't like that word threat, Phil. In the day and age we live, that kind of triggers me a little bit. Well, you're going to get triggered. Okay. He's making a threat, saying, if you don't do these things, because you left your first love, because you've abandoned me and your love for me, if you don't turn, I'm going out the door, and I'm taking the Holy Spirit with me. And you can have church. And you can sing the songs. And you can have your sermon. But you won't have me. And I dare say there's probably many a place over the years of Christianity in the church 
that have operated for many years without Christ being in the, in the midst of it. It doesn't mean they don't want church, but they don't have Christ. And can't tell you church isn't church without Christ. Mm -hmm. Kind of like heaven isn't heaven without Jesus. And so we understand these things that, that he's trying to tell them. There's some things that you need to, to know. And, he, and, and even this rebuke that he's saying here in this verse, number five, he's like, basically, remember the heights from which you have fallen. You were at one point in these heights, but you're no longer that way. You're in a valley, and you have chose, you have abandoned, you've turned. And there's this rebuke that despite their seriousness about holiness, despite their seriousness about sound doctrine, and despite their endurance, they're in danger of the presence and power of Jesus being removed from them. Because ultimately what Jesus is saying, you're missing the point. Okay? And can I tell you, this is something I know, <coughs> I know we're not supposed to worry, be anxious. I do a little bit. But can I tell you, this is something that's kind of haunted me since day one, 10 plus years ago when I became pastor here. Is that we could be serious about doing the things that Christians should do. We could be serious about learning the word of God. And we could even be ferocious, if you would, about walking in endurance and being faithful and yet abandon Christ's love or abandon our love for Christ at the one point he brought us here to begin with. Okay? And what I want to do, I want to kind of highlight how serious of a deal this is because it's easier to go, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, they're good about it. I mean, they're calling out wrong preachers, dude. Like, how much better does it get? That's like varsity level Christianity. Like, you know, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah love, love. Yeah, sure, sure. Love. But here's what I'm trying to tell you. Love for Christ is the whole point. You're like, man, we could have said that at the beginning and went home. No. But you need to understand in your walk with Christ, love for Christ is the whole point. You're like, well, no, it's this. No, it's this. No, it's that. No. Without a correct love for Christ, you will not do anything else in the way that pleases Christ, blesses Christ, and encourages Christ and Him help you. It's all about the love for Christ. And I want us to see this and, and I want us to understand that. And that's where this church is in a lot of trouble, regardless of how petty that might sound, because that's what it is. If you would flip over to Matthew chapter number 22. In Matthew chapter number 22, there's this teacher of the law that comes up to Jesus, and there's this massive debate that they're all having, right? And a massive debate amongst first century uh, people of God about what? Because they grew up with all the commandments, right? You're like, what do you mean? There's 10 commandments. There's like 613 commandments that the Hebrews have come to. Aren't you glad we got 10? Okay, we kind of condensed them all to 10. All right, so they're all arguing, you know, which one's the greatest commandment? This one's the greatest commandment. No, this one's the greatest commandment. And so they're going through all of this and which one's the great. And, and like, what's the whole point of the Christian faith? What's the whole point of the law? And, and so you have this group of people here saying, what's the point of it all, right? And, and you've got this other group over here saying, well, it's all about this. And this other group over here saying, it's all about this. This is the point of the law. And this other group saying, it's about this. So kind of in modern day, you could say it like this. So you got this church that says, well, it's all about tithing, or it's all about singing hymns, or it's all about uh, having this program, or it's all about, you know, having service at this time. And so they're all just giving good things. They're saying it's all about this and all about that. And, and so you see that, and, and a lot of times it's even like that in our church today, right? Don't believe me? <clears throat> How many years ago would possibly even some of you in this room thinking that a TV on the wall was simple? <laughs> How many years ago was it? Well, bless God, if we ain't got a pew, we ain't got a church. Thank God for the cushion seats, amen? Okay, if you don't like it, I'll carve a piece of wood out and throw it back there for you. You can enjoy it. You can endure it. Okay, if you want to do that. Isn't it interesting sometimes the things we call the point that really aren't the point? They're good. They're good. But they're not the point. And that was what was wrong with the church at Ephesus by Revelation. They did a lot of really great things. A lot of great things you like to be part of church. But they're missing something very, very, very important. They're missing the point. It says you left your first love. And so this teacher just basically goes, we're sitting here having this argument. We're sitting here having this fight. Hey, Jesus, what do you think? And if you look there in Matthew chapter 22, verse number 36, 
And he says, Master and teacher, basically it says, which is the greatest commandment of all? You tell us which one is, because they think that, and they think that, and they think that. And Jesus said unto them, verse 37, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is likened to it. Thou shalt love the Lord, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two things hang all, all, the law of prophets. That's the entire Old Testament. Amen. All of it. You can hang all of it on that. So, to the response, well, what's the point of this whole thing? Jesus looks around and says, your unwavered love for God and your devotion and love for people. That's right. And by the way, he put that in the order he did for a reason. Because you will truly never love people until your love for God is right. That's right. I will truly never love people, serve people, endure with people, be patient with people, Thank God people are patient with me. Show grace with people until I love the Lord my God with all my heart, my soul, mind. Because until I do that, everything's personal. Everything you do I don't like is personal. But when it's all about my love for God, it doesn't have to be personal. Right? I don't have to get upset about it. It's not against me. Right? And we have to understand that. It's about loving those things. And, and that's the whole point is our love for God and love for others. If I can say it like this. Our love for God, <laughs> excuse me, is a vertical reconciliation that leads to horizontal reconciliation. Amen. Right? That shows Christ as supreme, Christ as preeminent. So a church that loses love for God and ultimately for people, they lose the point of what's happening. There's a quote, an anonymous quote I just want to give you. I'll throw it up on there. It said this, a church that knows about Jesus and does not love Jesus is a dying church and a church that will not be around for long. A church that knows about Jesus but does not love Jesus is a church that will not be around for long. You hear me say this from time to time. A church that knows about Jesus is here. But it's got to drop from your head to your heart sometime. Right? It's got to go from knowledge action. It's got to go there. You know, a church that has a knowledge of the character of God and does not find him or herself captivated by the beauty of God in that church, can I tell you the clock's ticking? The clock's ticking on that church. In that love is the point. Love for God. Love for our neighbors. And that's what Jesus said. And the point of all of it is that you'll be reconciled to God, that you and I would love God, and that would spill over into our families, into our neighborhoods, into our jobs. That's the point. And as I said, it goes back, and you can see this everywhere. Love for God affects your love for people. So you say, Phil, I don't, I don't necessarily agree with that. Okay, great. Flip over to 1 John. Remember the pastor there still at, uh, at one point there at uh, Ephesus. 1 John chapter 4. And the reason I'm saying this is because some of us that grew up kind of a, a stern way, we're like, man, all I hear is this. God is love stuff, God. There's a whole lot more to that, okay? So we can't just say God is love. But he spends pretty much the whole book of 1 John saying he is. Okay? To Christians. Okay? God is holy. God is just. God is a God of wrath, right? But God is also a God of love. You can't have one without the other. By the way, you truly never understand the love of God, but truly understand the justice and the wrath of God. Because they go hand in hand. But anyways, let me just go on with this. So speaking that love is the point... Let me ask you a question. What drives out fear? Courage. Nope. Being fearless. Nope, not according to the Bible. Look at 1 John 4, verse 18. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. Because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love, because we love him. Why? Because he first loved us. That's why buying biblically sound is good. Can I just tell you, the more that you know the love of God, the more you'll have love for God. The more that you know the love of God for you, you'll have love for God yourself. It's just, it's just the way it works. It, I mean, it's just the way it works and how you grow together. And so what drives out fear? Love drives out fear. Do, do, do you want to battle fear? You want to battle that anxiety in your life? Then grow in your love. Grow in your love for God. Find that person that you have so much anxiety with and find something to love. You say, Phil, it's going to be hard. It's okay. 
Grow in your love for them. Grow in your love for God. Love stabilizes your soul. It stabilizes your soul. Can I tell you, love received can be love given. Love received can be love given. You cannot love others if you feel like you're unloved. If you feel unloved and you feel rejected, you will not love others the way that you and I should. We can't do it, right? We can't do it. It's not a, not a soul transformed. It's not walking in joy that can empathize deeply with people and weep with people and rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those that weep. And the danger is this. If we're not careful, we're going to do so many things well, like this church here at Ephesus did. We're going to do so many things well, but those things are going to get lost if we don't have the love for Christ. Right? That's the danger. Remember what it talks about in 1 Corinthians 13. What does it say? Faith, hope, and love remain. But the greatest of these is what? Love. love. Not faith. Not hope. Love. 1 Corinthians 13. If you get a chance to read. Well, we'll read it real quick. 1 Corinthians 13. Um, it's called the love chapter. You're like, oh, I love that. If you're single, you're like, oh, that's great. That'll help me in my, my love life. That's not what 1 Corinthians 13 is about. You might want to go to Song of Solomon, but we're not doing that. Okay. All right. 1 Corinthians 13. Let me read verse 1 to you. This is Paul again. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels. By the way, I, I can't even explain that. Speak with the tongues of angels. Maybe you can. Okay. And, but it says, and I have not charity or have not love. I have become as a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. I don't know if you've ever had the joy and privilege in life of listening to children learn to play an instrument. <laughs> Many of us have gone through that stage in life. You know, you know the recorders? Those instruments of Satan? You know what I'm talking about? I'm talking about. You know, they, whatever it is, you ever listen to a child learn how to play an instrument? You're like, oh, it's beautiful. It's part of the process. I know it is. I just wish they do it somewhere else. You know what I mean? I mean, it's beautiful. It's great. I get it. You imagine what sounding brass and tink. Imagine somebody sitting there beating on a gong, and someone else is playing the cymbals, and they're not together. They're not on beat. One gets loud, one gets soft, and they're like they're competing against each other. That is not the special we're going to have next time. Praise the Lord. Yeah, all right, yeah. We're not going to have that. Can you imagine what that is like. And here's what he just said. If I could even speak the words of the angels, but I don't have love, I sound like the gong. Verse 2. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have what? All, what's the next word? Faith. That's big there. Okay. So that I could remove mountains and have not charity or love, I have nothing. Remember that tells me, move mountains? Jesus said, if you had the faith of the grain of a mustard seed, you could save in this mountain. Go, go, cast yourself into the ocean. And it would do it. Because you know what he said? If I could understand all the mysteries of the Bible, I could understand everything about Revelation. I can. If you understand everything about Revelation, everything mystery of the Bible, everything about these things, and you could, because of your faith, tell, tell the landscape to, re, to change, he said, if you don't have love for God and love for people, it's meaningless. Amen. That's big words. Yes, amen. Those are big, big, big words. And can you say, well, Phil, how do I grow in my love for God? I'm glad you asked. I know our time's about up. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians 5, two verses. I almost preached this passage today. I was really torn in that. I felt bad because I know Brother Doug wanted to know what, what verses he was reading. And I was between 2 Corinthians 5 and Revelation 2. So I, I still have to give you a little 2 Corinthians 5. 2 Corinthians 5, 14 says, For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. So what constrains Paul to preach the gospel? What constrains Paul to continue to do what he's doing? The love of Christ. And you want to see the love of Christ manifested? Probably a verse that you've heard me say a thousand times, and you're going to hear me say a thousand times till I die. Same chapter, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Can I read it like this? 
for God made Jesus to be sin for me. Jesus knew no sin, that I might be made the righteousness of God by Jesus. That's what that verse is saying. That's the love of Christ that constrains us. That makes us love with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind. And you say, well, how do we come about that? Well, that's what verse 5 says. And I'll just give you these three and we'll be done. He says, remember. He says, repent. He says, do the works. Or if you don't, I'm removing my presence. So how do we do that? So how do we, if we're finding ourselves drifting, but we're still doing a lot of good stuff, I'm still coming to church, I'm still throwing something to the plate, I'm still being nice, I'm still doing this, this. what do you do to really test or just take the temperature of your love for God? Which is the whole reason why he said, I'm going to snuff this out. Remember the works of the Lord in your life. The children of Israel over and over again got in trouble and wandered from God. Why? Because it says over and over again, and they forgot to remember the works of old. Psalm 77 is a great song. In the midst of all, Psalm 77 is a psalm of great discouragement and distress and almost depression. And he talks about his depression, uh, Asaph does. And then he says in the middle of the Psalm 77, How will we remember the works of the Lord? I will rejoice in thy wonders of old. You know what he says? I'm going to remember you, God. I'm going to remember everything you've done in my life. And then repent. The Bible says that we confess our sin. He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all rights. To repent means this, to be honest with God about what it is and to turn. It's not just acknowledgement. Repent is to turn. And also do the works. The Bible says faith without works is what? Death. To keep on keeping on in those things. And so today, and I appreciate your attention this morning. I love what God's doing in the life of our church. And by the way, not just our church, but great churches all over the place here. And you know what scares me to death? We can become a church that does a lot of really good things, but misses the point. That's right. The point of it is this, to love the Lord your God. He, Jesus says, you're doing a lot of really good things about me, but you have no more love for me. Keep being in love with him. Keep doing things that stir your affections for God. You hear me say that a lot. In your life, think about what stirs my affections for God and pursue those and things that rob your affections for Jesus and stay away from them. I ain't saying they're bad. I'm just saying they're not going to help you grow closer to Christ in those things. But may we ultimately realize that the love of God and our love for God, that is the point. Let's stand together. You if you don't mind, just maybe with your heads bowed and eyes closed just for a moment as Brent begins to play. As I always like to do, I just want to give you an opportunity. This was some silent prayer reflection there. And maybe in your world, everything's going great. May I say this? The church in Ephesus thought everything was going great too. Because all the things they were doing, we have to remember, I must decrease and he must increase. And maybe today, if nothing else, you just remember the goodness of God. Maybe God did bring something to your heart that you need to repent of. Make it right with him. He desires that. Maybe you're starting to wane from the good works that he wants you to do, that others may see what your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Maybe ask him to help you as you endure into faithfulness.
you look this way. Um, I'm glad I got more opportunity to talk to some people who are interested in partnering with us today. So we got Miss Anna George Warnock. She's down here. And she brought her granddaughter, brought Abby. A lot of y'all know Abby and them. And, yeah. and I talked to both of them individually. Uh, they know they have faith in Jesus Christ as their Savior. And they both have told me individually they feel God's desire for them to partner and become members of our church. So if you rejoice with me and their decision and following God's will, let you say amen. 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 All right. They act like they're shy. They're not. Okay. You can ask us. He knows. Okay. That's part of that. Uh, but anyhow, y'all get a chance. Come down here just for a second. Just kind of greet them and thank them for being a part of that and be praying for them. But I'm just thankful that God led you guys to do this. This is good. I know you love attention. That's really good. But we'll do this. We'll close in a word of prayer. And again, make time to come up here if you don't mind. And uh, But also, if you are the parent of a teen, I just need a few minutes right down here to give you uh, some, some information about that. But Brother John, if you don't mind, will you close this place? Lord, we thank you um, again for this opportunity to be here this morning. Lord, we thank you.